and an introduction to biblical interpretation for the advanced readers in your midst. The information that I share here is predominantly taken from this book, written by Klein, Blomberg, and Hubbard. Highly recommend it if you want to be more advanced in your reading of the biblical text. I was watching a video the other day, uh, and uh, the brother in the video said, he was talking about kind of reading the Bible, and he said, you know, Protestants essentially have taught that, you know, you read the Bible and the Holy Spirit will just reveal to you the text and whatever the Holy Spirit reveals to you is good and you'll, you'll go with that. That's a really poor understanding of what Protestantism generally has taught in regards to doing a proper hermeneutic of the biblical text. It was always about going back to the source material, right? It's kind of the Renaissance movement. And so the source material in this case is the Bible. That's very important. We can talk a lot of stuff surrounding Christianity, Christian doctrine, explanations, very whatever. I can go all day with that. I highly recommend that you guys um, take this to heart because this is a very interesting genre. But most people think they know what the genre of prophecy is, and I will explain that in a couple of different ways uh, as to what's going on in the text. But uh, we're looking here in regards to the genre of prophecy, and there are multiple ways you can think about this. People love prophecy because it's weirdly mysterious, right? People love prophecy because it's like, oh, end time stuff. That's like immediately what comes to their mind. Let me tell you this. Uh, prophecy in regards to end times and all that stuff is a minority of a minority when it comes to the biblical genre of prophecy. Once you figure this out, your life will... If you don't know this and you figure it out, your life will be changed. I'm dead serious about that you will actually figure out what the symbolism in the text is and what's going on and what's trying to be said. So we're going to simplify this for all of our sake. So here we go. The role of the prophet. Um, what is the main role of the prophet in the ancient Israelite community? So you have three categories, you could say, of influential characters, influential offices in the Old Testament. Um, in religiously speaking, you have two. So you have the priestly order that's led by the high priest. And then you have the prophet. The prophets seem to be the individuals that God raises up whenever religious orders even go wrong. So say the high priests... Uh, go in a certain direction or the priestly order goes in a certain direction that God doesn't desire, he raises up the prophet to call these people back to repentance. You also have the king there as well. And these were kind of checks and balances that work together really well. So you can think about the example of uh, King David sinning and, uh, and he gets confronted by the prophet um, Nathan, I believe. And it's interesting that Nathan is the one confronting him. The prophet is the one confronting him, rather than, say, the high priest. So why is that? Well, in different times in Israel's history, the high priests were corrupt themselves. And then you get different kinds of prophets. So what is their role? What are, here's the main role. Here's what the office of a prophet in the Old Testament, and I should add, that should be distinguished from the, uh, from the gift of prophecy in the New Testament. I know there's a lot of confusion right now in the world, in the Christian world, the office of the prophet from the Old Testament does not follow to the New Testament. But you could say that there is a gift of prophecy that follows into the New Testament. And that means a couple of different things. You have to be very careful about this. Uh, because if you don't understand how the prophets and the gift of prophecy sort of works in the Old Testament, you might think all the New Testament prophecy includes is, um, you know, one of these categories. So, the main role of the prophet is that he is a spokesperson for Yahweh. 
And this can happen in multiple ways. What can happen in multiple ways? Being a spokesperson. So one of the ways is the majority way. Most of the time, a majority of the time, the prophet reminds the people what it is to be in covenant with Yahweh. A good way to remember this is by calling it forth-telling. So you are forth-telling, telling forth, what is already written in the biblical text. So the prophets would get up and say, look, here's the covenant of God. And you have to be faithful to the covenant of God. So repent and come back to the covenant of God. If you do not repent, God will judge you because God has said in his covenant, if you disobey me, I will judge you. None of this information is new information to anybody in the uh, biblical world because all of it was written down. All of it is found in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. It's forth-telling the law of God. It's forth-telling what has already been written. This is the purpose, and it's the majority, you could say, of prophetic writing. We'll distinguish that between the prophets themselves versus actual prophetic writing. Those are two different categories. The second category here is the prophet speaks out, uh, speaks about those things which Yahweh will do in the near or the far future. So, for example, if you guys do not repent, or he knows that you're not going to repent, God will judge you in the following way, and then there's a description given about the following way, so that's about the near or the far future, right? And, and that is called foretelling. That's foretelling the future. So foretelling is stuff you the prophet is saying that's already written down and known by all the people. Foretelling is speaking about events to come. And definitely that happens. So they were the representative of God or the rep representatives of God, just like the priests were the representatives of the people. So pay close attention to that. The priests are representing the people before God. The prophets are speaking the word of God to the people. So you get this really cool mixture of both of these things. That's very important. Um, number two. There are many prophets in the history of Israel whose words were not written to us as sayings from God. So we know more about their actions or they're written in narrative form. So we know a lot more than, uh, about their actions than we know about their actual prophetic words that were written down, if they were written down. So ex a good example of this would be Elijah and Elisha. Notice there's no prophetic book, right? Like you don't have a book in the Old Testament of Elijah or Elisha, but you have Isaiah and Jonah, right? You have Malachi. These are prophetic books. You need to develop the ability to tell the difference between a prophetic individual, a prophet that functioned in Israel, and the prophetic book. Our focus is prophetic literature. This is point number three. This is why it is important to understand that we are uh, what we are looking at. And the specific thing is that we're looking at prophetic literature specifically rather than the prophets. And prophetic literature is a very interesting category in and itself because prophetic literature has a combination of, you could say, different types of literature. <laughs> Uh, it implements different uh, literary aspects, right? And if you don't understand those, again, problematic, misinterpretation, misapplication, you know, kaboom. So here are a number of different prophetic utterances that we get. These are different categories. Number one, you get a you get the lawsuit. This is when uh, a prophetic utterance is from God and is taking Israel to court because Israel has broken the law. So example of this would be Isaiah 3, 
13 to 16. So God is essentially taking Israel to court because they have broken contract, the covenant. And so therefore, whatever the stipulations of the contract are, Israel has to pay, I should say. Number two, there are woe, um, or these also are sort of judgment um, prophecies. Uh, This is when the prophetic utterance has to do with the coming disaster or death. So consider Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. And usually it has three parts. There's an announcement of the distress. So thus says the Lord, behold, I'm bringing the Babylonians upon you. These dreaded people who do, who do not, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, by the way, uh, who do not understand mercy. And I will use them to judge you, right? There's the reason for the distress. Usually the reason for the distress is going to take you back to the lawsuit. You guys broke a covenant. You haven't repented. And so therefore I'm going to judge you. I'm going to bring about this distress upon you. And then this prediction of doom. And again, the prediction of doom is the stuff that is foretelling it's going to happen the following way or it's going to happen for this amount of time all right it's going to be 70 years you're going to be uh you know make sure you get married when you're in that distant land when you're in babylon and there's words about that third there is the what's called the promise and these this speaks about a day that will come where there will be a radical change which will bring about a blessing so consider Amos chapter 9, verses 11 to 15. Um, this promise could be in multiple ways. It could be a promise locally placed in the sense of, hey, there will be a time where I will bring my people back to the land. Uh, a couple of examples of this. Um, Daniel, when he's reading the scroll of Jeremiah, realizes that this has, it has been 70 years. And so therefore, he goes, oh, it's the, the, the completion of this is, is uh, you know, at hand. Um, when you see uh, individuals like uh, Nehemiah, they, they realize there's, th- these things are being fulfilled. They're going back into the land. There's other prophetic words that are further into the future where the conversation's more about let's just say the kingdom of God coming, um, kind of this this radical peace being with humanity. Um, it is going to be a time where the child sits uh, next to the, uh, next to the, um, the serpent's uh, uh, nest or hole and puts his hand in there and doesn't get bitten. It's, it's when the wolf and the, uh, and the lamb can lay together uh, it's that kind of kind of this outrageous piece uh, that is beyond human understanding, which I would say is what we call the messianic kingdom and all that. Uh, but that that's a further along prophetic utterance. Number four, there's an enactment prophecy. This is when God not only tells the prophet to speak, but to specifically act out a certain scenario. So you can look up Isaiah 20 for that. Ezekiel is known to do this in a very, very interesting way where God tells him, you know, you got to lay down, uh, you know, on your side naked for a year and you got to eat food that's made, uh, that's cooked on human waste where he argues with God and says, no, that's, that, that's unclean. I can't do that. And then God allows him to do it, um, to cook it with uh, cow um, poop and uh, again but he's acting out right he's acting out what the dramatic fall the dramatic judgment of God on the people is going to look like uh, and number five there's the messenger speak speech uh, this is usually stated with the phrase this is what the Lord says or this is what Yahweh says or Thus says Yahweh, thus says the Lord. It is specifically focused on transmitting a message from Yahweh. Um, And you'll see this in Isaiah, when God calls Isaiah, you'll see it in Jeremiah. Go and tell the people this. A very interesting example of this 
is a prophetic book that has, uh, and I want to focus on this a little bit, but it's a prophetic book that has a couple of different components to it. Um, and uh, it's, it's the book of Jonah. So Jonah does not have any prophetic literature uh, to the reader. It's, it's not there. I don't know if you've noticed that about Jonah. And this is why I like using Jonah as an example when I talk about prophecy. It's a prophetic book. But have you ever noticed there's no prophecy in the book of Jonah? Meaning prophecy towards the reader. Here's the way it sets up. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah. And God says, I'm going to destroy the people of Nineveh. And I want you to go and tell them that I'm going to judge them. And Jonah says, no, I'm not going to go tell him that because Jonah doesn't like the Ninevites very much and tries to run away from God. And uh, through various circumstances, God gets him to uh, Nineveh. And Jonah goes into the midst of Nineveh and prophesies. This is foretelling. He says, God's going to destroy you guys. And, And then the people repent. And then Jonah is sad that the people repented. And the book ends with a question that God asks Jonah. Um, and, and the question he asks them is, you cared a lot about this tree that just grew up and withered away to give you shade. How much more do I care about these people and their animals, it actually says. And the book ends. Why is this a prophetic word? Why is this a prophetic word? book why should we consider the book of jonah prophetic because the book itself is calling people to repentance because the book itself is forth telling something even though there's no literal forth telling coming from the mouth of jonah to the audience that's reading this book the book itself is forth telling so jonah For example, let me tell you how many categories uh, of um, genres there are in the book of Jonah. Jonah is a narrative. It just tells us a story of this prophet who's sort of disobedient to God but ends up being obedient. Jonah, a, a good section in the book of Jonah, has a psalm in it. When Jonah is in the belly of the fish, he sings a song. He, he writes a psalm to the Lord. So it's got poetry. It's got narrative. Um, The book of Jonah has pro- prophecy in it, meaning he, he prophesies to the Ninevites about what's going to happen to them so that there's prophecy in Jonah. And the, books, the book itself is prophetic. Four genres in a very tiny book. And you better know you're reading narrative, that's a prophecy. And that's very different than reading, um, say, Uh, Isaiah, that's very different than reading Jeremiah. It's very different than reading Daniel. Right? The book of Daniel has quite a bit of prophecy in it. In, in, uh, interpretation of dreams are taking place in it. It's various things. And, and, and Daniel is one of these books that has multiple things happening in it as well. So it's, it's, it's complicated. I want to warn you guys against people who just randomly will quote something out of Daniel, assuming that you know, you know what it is and they know what it is and the application thereof. Just make sure you ask the proper questions. So, here's a couple of things that are important about prophecies. Number one, prophecies, there are prophecies, this is foretelling, that have multiple fulfillments. An example of this would be the prophetic word that comes to David, King David, and the prophetic word is that upon his throne will sit his son, whose kingdom will have no end. Well, part of that is fulfilled in his son, Solomon, who sits on his throne. If you look at the whole text, Solomon fulfills it. But we realize that Solomon doesn't fully fulfill it because Solomon doesn't sit on the throne of David forevermore. And so people kind of look at it and they say, well, it's prophetic in one sense, but it must have a greater fulfillment to it. Okay? It has a greater fulfillment to it. And so therefore, there is an expectation 
that people have had and yeah, some people still have and some people have had and they realize it's Jesus, which I would say is the correct understanding of this because there's only one who can sit on the throne of David forever and it's one who doesn't die again. It's very, very simple. Um, and, and so you have one fulfillment and then you have a fuller fulfillment. So it has multiple fulfillments. Um, and then you have prophecy that looks to be immediate, but it will take time. Um, maybe one of the um, examples of this might be the day of the Lord, right? Like this day of the Lord, is it is it like immediate that's happening? And it seems like there's a component of it that is immediate. But there's this aspect of it taking time for the kingdom of God to come and then the day of the Lord to come. There's these events that take place before that event happens, right? So it seems to be immediate. Uh, or the or God's judgment. Another example. This is actually maybe even a better one. That God, uh, there's a prophetic word that the Babylonians will come, say in Habakkuk. There's a prophetic word that the Babylonians will come and take over Israel. But when you look at the actual historical events, this judgment, this exile that happens actually happens in multiple occurrences. There's three different exiles that happen. The people are kicked out of the land on three different occasions. And that's um, that's a prophecy that kind of begins, but again, has uh, it's immediate to a certain extent, but it will take time to kind of fully come to its fruition. Um, okay, so Simply put, that those are a couple of examples of prophetic literature. Again, prophetic literature to be distinguished from prophets themselves. Um, one of the other things I will add is usually in the literature, you will see the call of the prophet. And some people um, are already prophets. So... Jeremiah is called to be a prophet from his mother's womb. Uh, as opposed to Amos, who gets called to be a prophet, and he's got, you know, he's a farmer, and he gets called to be a prophet, and it seems like that's for a limited amount of time, and he goes and prophesies and kind of go back, goes back to his job. Um, and maybe a bit different from that would be Isaiah, where Isaiah is already a functioning prophet. There's a unique thing in the book of Isaiah that you, you might have not noticed, and I'll help you notice here, is that, uh, most of the time, in the Old Testament, you will say the word, you will see the word of the Lord came to such and such, the son of so and so, and that will be in chapter one, where in Isaiah the call of the prophet comes in chapter six, and that is to say that Isaiah is already a functioning prophet. We're told that he's a prophet, but specifically, there is a different prophetic ministry that. God, Yahweh, is calling Isaiah to function in. Uh, and uh, that changes the dynamic of how you read that text. This is not just like just generally anything. It's th There's something happening unique here, and, and God wants Isaiah to be on his toes, to go about, to do the work. Uh, there's prophetic words that are spoken to Israel very clearly. There's also prophetic words that you will see in some of these books that are against the surrounding nations and why they're being judged, what their crimes are. He pronounces woes on people. He pronounces judgment on people. Um, he compares them to uh, really hostile and evil people in the past, and he says they would have repented, and, and if, they, if these things have, were done in them, they would have repented. But you guys are unrepentant. So try to, next time you're picking a, a, a book to read, try to employ these things. Try to, very, at the very least, ask, what am I reading? What kind of prophecy am I reading? Because if it's prophecy, you're reading of the sense of it's compared to the law, you should know the law. So go back and read the law and then go, oh, the, so the punishments are all there. Nothing is surprising. So when the people of Israel are kicked out of the land because they're being disobedient to God, that's not surprising. That's not new information for them because in the law, it says, if you don't keep my covenant, the land will vomit you out as it did its previous inhabitants. So everybody's aware of it. Everybody knows what's going on. 
those are some just introductory notes in regards to what a uh, what the genre of prophecy is. It'll be it w- again, it would be very very difficult to sit there and cover every single aspect of prophecy, but this is just to get you guys started and going. If you're interested, diving deep into some of this stuff, biblical interpretation by Klein, Blomberg, and Hubbard is the book that you want to get. That's in the description box, just to help you out a bit. Thank <laughs> you.